Everybody loves a rags to riches story. So brought my friend Nick Unsworth up from San Diego. And uh, so Nick was completely broke at, uh, what'd you say, 28? 28. 28, 28 50 G's in debt. And then turned it around through a series of steps we're going to talk about. And at age 30, sold his first business for 500 grand. So, a little over 500 grand. A little over yeah. 500. Get I'm the bad. number. Get the numbers exactly <laughs> right. So, you know, sometimes when you're watching the news, you see these stories where somebody's broke and then they're the next Bill Gates and they make, you know, $40 billion. And that's all great. But it's also good to understand that you don't always have to have a home run hit. You can just first base, second base, third base. And in fact, that's what Warren Buffett said Benjamin Graham told him. That's a safer approach. So let's talk about this story. Thanks for being yeah, on. Man. Yeah. It's good to be here. So Thanks how did it feel? Thanks for all the snacks. He likes the snacks. <laughs> the snacks. <laughs> he liked the, the chili at lunch was like incredible. You're easy to bribe to come up and <laughs> talk. We just get some food. <laughs> Ten bucks worth of food and Nick Nick. I'm there. Yeah, you're there. Speaking fee is like cheese and crackers. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about Mental state when you're fifty thousand in debt, you're twenty eight. Had you lost momentum? Did you have oh, a college man. degree? Like, what's your, what's that background? Yeah. So I mean, just to just a real quick, just to catch up to the college years. Yeah. Um, you know, re really fortunate with loving family. My dad just 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 a workhorse. I mean, he had to work. Uh, you know lived in Connecticut. He drove to New Hampshire and back every single day huh. to work as a commercial builder. So he was just constantly sacrificing, constantly gr grinding so that he could put us through college. So as a kid, I saw that and I just, I never understood it. You know, just as a kid, you just think, well, why, why isn't he there? You know? Right. But, um, he was just grinding. And for me, I looked at it as I didn't, I wanted to always have more. I want to be, you know, more happiness, more freedom. So I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. And then, you know, I was six years old. My brother was nine. So he had a paper route. Huh. I demanded half at six years old. So <laughs> I was knocking dealer. on doors at six okay. as a little kid and just, you know, collecting money, delivering papers, hustling. And uh, 14 years old, I was picking tobacco on my hands and knees. Huh. Um, I was making seven fifty an hour at? Uh, in Connecticut, in Windsor okay. Locks. I didn't even know they could grow it up north that far. Oh, yeah. Though, so the outside wrapper on cigars, yeah. like the finest of the fine cigars, is actually Connecticut shade tobacco. Learn but, something new every day. But, I mean, you're 100 degrees plus under the nets. And, I mean, I would work 14-hour days. Yeah. I mean, crazy. But um, So I always was saving money, you know, um, and just trying to get ahead. Went to college, went to UConn, totally wasn't, like... I really wasn't into, I didn't like learning about science and other things. I just want to learn about business. So I ended up uh, interning as a financial advisor at, you know, 20 years old because it was a good internship. And it was hilarious. I was selling, you know, whole life insurance and yeah. trying to talk to 40 year olds about investing their money. And they're like, kid, what on earth do you know? It's like being a 20 year old life coach, you know? Yeah. Um, so from that experience, um, my mentor in that business sits me down at a coffee shop and he pulls out this little flip book and he's like, I want to show you something. And he starts flipping and he's talking about telecom and he's talking about the deregulation of telecom and like the bell companies and the baby bells and all this stuff and long distance, all that was deregulated and he's flipping through and then it was all about um, network marketing. So three people who get three people who get three people, uh, you build this MLM. huge empire, yeah. right? And I'm sitting there, I'm like, hold on. I'm like, Steve, so you're telling me Instead of retiring at 65, you're telling me I can build this thing out and in three to five years, I can build up enough residual income to not have to work or not need to work. And he's like, that's what I'm saying. So I'm like, all right. <laughs> so you're selling Amway. I'm like, I'm all in. I'm what was like, it? What was it's called Excel Communications. Excel. They were a $2 billion company. I think I've heard of that. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's like you tell, you get cheaper long distance or something like that. Ironically, it was actually more expensive. More expensive. All right, <laughs> that was that's a problem. tough sell. Who wants to sp spend more bills? Sign up. But that was the thing. They were like, so if you could sell that, you would got good at sales. Well, that's the thing is they said just go out and get twenty customers that yeah. meets your quota. Then you just sell other people on getting twenty customers. Yeah. And so I got so fired up. I came home, and and I'm like, mom, mom, you know. And I had one of those old Zach Morris uh, um, cell phones. So I'm in my like college place 
in uh, my, my dorm or whatever, and I call up my mom, and I'll never forget this because I was always searching for purpose and trying to find like my dream career in business. And I'm like, I found it. I'm like, I, I found what I'm gonna do. I found my purpose. And, um, and I start describing it. And then all of a sudden, she literally started screaming, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, it's a pyramid scam. She just kept saying pyramid scam, pyramid scam. <laughs> And I'm sitting there and like literally I just like dropped the phone, the faceplate came off. And by the way, we're not saying that all MLMs are pyramids. <laughs> yeah. There's some decent ones. There's some good ones. There's yeah. some ones people make a little bit of money, but yeah. So so that was crazy. And um, And by the way, you know what you remind me of? Have you seen the office episode where it's at the very beginning where Michael, you know, the main character, he comes in and he's like, whatever, he's getting ripped off in one of these and Jim Halpert, the cooler brain guy goes, uh, this reminds me a little bit of when you sent, wired all this money to Africa from an email and Michael goes, what do you do when the king of Swahili or whatever son is in need? You wire him the money. <laughs> and it's a funny little, we've all gotten those emails where it's like, what is your, oh, yeah. what is your bank account? That. I've got 10, you fell for oh, that once? Oh, so, so <laughs> my you friends love fell for one of these. So, right around, so. This is a quick, tiny tangent, but I think it's worth no, it. No, it's good. So yep. I was always down no to tangents. do anything to, you know, to get ahead and, and to have financial freedom. And so um, one of those letters came in the mail, and it was a check, and it was like a legit check. Yeah. And it was like, if you deposit this, then wire the money to Swahili. You know, yeah. it was like one of those scams. But I figured if I deposit the check and it clears, I'm obviously not going to wire the money. Yeah. But what happened was... My parents, um, just in case anything happened to them, so they had like a, a bank account that they had in my name too. Just if they, right. if anything happened to them, I'd have access to cash or something. Yeah. I could never touch it. So what happened was the check goes in, and um, it bounces, and but it doesn't come. Up. I didn't have enough co cash to cover it. Yeah. So then it pulled from my parents' account. Oh, so then no. they became aware of it. Oh, so they, and my mom they... ripped me a new a hole. I mean, <laughs> it was just like there is. She, I remember her just screaming, "There is no get rich quick." There is no shortcut. Like, there is get rich quick. What you do, you go <laughs> in time machine and with genetic engineering and you change your parents to be the queen, queen of England. <laughs> That's the best get rich quick. See, That's my friend, true. you know what the best one, I won't say his name because this will embarrass him, but this may be the best story in the history of mankind. He also wanted to get rich. He always got ripped off on every late night, whatever. By the way, my shoelace is here. And so he sees in the back of a magazine, a thing that said, become a professional male gigolo. If you've seen the movie Deuce Bigelow, right? So his thing, he's like- he's Based gonna, on a true story? Yeah, based <laughs> on a true story. He's like, dude, this is the greatest thing. It was, no, it, it was, sorry, it was, a, it was a male escort, it was. And he go, so he was just in from another country, I won't say which country, he moved to the US. He was going to university in New York. And he goes, this is great. I already like women. And you're saying women are gonna pay me to take them out, seduce them or whatever? So he spent, it was like $300 and they give you like a whole little book on where to post ads and how to do it. So he gets the book, he's like, this is awesome. He posts his ad. This is back, I think before the internet, he's older, newspaper. And he said, all of a sudden dudes were calling me. <laughs> and I'm like thinking, this is escorting. That's not worth it. <laughs> no, no, but he didn't get that. Like in the U.S., male escorts are mostly oh, for that's guys. True, yeah. Okay, which is nothing wrong, you know, guys. But my friend was not gay, and so he was sorely disappointed sorely. when never, no, no, no woman ever called him. He was like, e even if it was an old woman, I would have done. But he's like, yeah. So he lost his three hundred bucks. So the moral of the story is. There's no get rich quick, no. unless the king and the queen thing. Yep. <laughs> All right, back to our story line here. <laughs> That's good. So, so, um, so what happened with network marketing is, uh, for me, is I got so fired up about that, um, about that business, and I talked to literally every human being I had ever met up to that point, and I was about 20 years old, and every single person that I knew said no, and most of them said it was a pyramid scheme or scam, and. Uh, I went back to my upline guy and I said, Steve, man, um, everyone said no. And like, what do I do now? And he goes, hmm, all right. 
I'm gonna set you an appointment with the millionaire who's in Connecticut, this dude Tommy, and uh, he's gonna help you out. He's like, you just need more training. So I go do lunch with him. It's at Denny's. Okay. So where all millionaires eat. There's some red, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of red flaggage, but you know, I'm trying to look past it because when you want something so bad, right. like eh, the red flag warning like signs, that. like forget those. So I, uh, you know, meet him at Denny's, and I was a little skeptical because of that scenario, but he walks in with his little girl, you know, hand in hand, and he says, "I'm the only daddy at dance class. I'm the only daddy at the bus stop, and it's because of this company, because of Excel." And so right there in that moment, I said, "You know what?" I didn't care that every single person said no to me. Right there in the moment, I picked up this little magazine that went out to reps all over the world, and I looked to the back page and it said Rookie of the Year, this dude Stephen K. And I said, you know what? And that was him? No, just okay, a totally just a random okay. different guy. But and I pointed and I said, How much will you get or I said, What will you give me if I become the rookie of the year? Huh. And he goes, I'll buy you a thousand dollar Movado watch. And at 20 years old, that right. was, might as well have said a million. You know, yeah. I was like, shook his hand, done. I will bet you I will, I will do it. And so even though I had no success, I just got all fired up from that. I learned how to market, learned how to, it wasn't even marketing. So you, you didn't get to the rookie? I, I Oh, am I, I skipping? Did. I'm messing the story. Yeah, no, Sorry. I mean, I, so basically, I Rewind. mean, I, <laughs> uh, I, so basically, I mean, I, I was doing in college, I was, the guy in the cafeteria doing presentations. I was bringing in this. this you were the annoying guy. <laughs> yeah, dude. You have a lot of friends, but you were making some money. I, I, yeah, I created the future. Were you doing it on dates when you're like oh. taking a girl out and you're like, this is more than a date. This is also a business presentation. I, I, I'd be like, I'd be like, hey, so um, how many friends do you have? Okay, you have 30 That's friends. You have and if 30 friends each got three people, yes. I mean, I mean, come on. Yeah, it doesn't take long till the whole world is in your <laughs> downline. So from that experience, uh, what ended up happening is I ended up rec you know, recruiting, I was doing the presentations, I was a little bit annoying in college, um, you know, building up a team and things, and I ended up getting the rookie of the year, graduated from college. Did he get you the watch? Got me the watch, okay. a couple months late, you know, because yeah. I think, you know, finances or whatever. But, but he still got it for you. But yeah, he still got it. Because he didn't, I when he said he'll get you day. the watch, he didn't say the day. <laughs> he exactly. had a 90 day clause to get you the watch. Yeah, and I think it was it was because of, you know, finances were tight or something, but we're a little sketchy. But uh, but anyway, I ended up, I got the watch, things were good. I ended up running with that business and I told, I was getting made fun of and I was getting hate on a little bit, you know, Future Millionaires Club. And, uh, but I could throw a good party, so I'm still cool. I right. know how to throw some good parties. So I Were graduated. you making decent money? Yeah, I was making mm, four to six grand a month okay. in college. It's not bad. Yeah. Pay your way. Yeah. And I said to everyone, I said, you know what? Like, because people were kind of hating, like, ah, oh, yeah, we'll see where that goes. It'll be gone in no time. And it's all right. When I graduate, the weekend after I graduate, I'm going to have a sick BMW. You watch. And so I graduate, I go out and get an M3 BMW, all that stuff. Totally rec reckless with money. And um, that was in May in 2004. After that, what ended up happening is by September, I'm growing the fastest pace I've ever grown. Like my team was growing like crazy. I'm pushing harder and harder. Didn't I turned down jobs, all that good stuff. And that September, Excel did this big annual event. Everyone goes there. They made the criteria to get promoted easier. Yeah. So I'm growing like crazy. I'm expecting all these big checks. And they went bankrupt uh. out of nowhere. Didn't get an email. Didn't get a phone call, none of that. We actually found out through word of mouth. So that's a, that affected your downline. That affected the income. The business disappeared. It disappeared. And the problem was I had all these young kids that signed up and they paid 400 bucks to get in the business. Uh, so, and the company was like, you're, you're beat, you're screwed. So now you're the bad guy. So I went and I paid for people that huh. um, so you gave I paid out of my pocket. Yeah. So I went, I, I didn't accumulate much money because I wasn't making that much money, but I quickly went negative and yeah. then I didn't have any income. I didn't want to go this get a job. This is at 28 now? No, this is shoot, This is technically at 22 at this point. Oh, wow. Okay. So, I mean, this is my first near bankruptcy. And then, so it, it, I was in this spot where I had this car and insurance. I was paying 1500 a month. Good and God. It, what kind of insurance did you have? Dude, my insurance, your driving record? <laughs> my insurance was 478 a month. Oof. Yeah, it was. Ferraris and Lambos would get high, but even those are only it was like bad. a I was, I was so a young Because I was so okay. young. And, and um, yeah, so I wrong. just quickly learned some hard knocks lessons. I'll, I'll skip some of the other rag stories, but I basically went from that 
to jumping the network marketing company to network marketing company. I then got in real estate. I got into real estate um, in early 2007, and I <laughs> not a good time, dude. I moved to San Diego to do this big project on the Hard Rock Hotel. The first time my parents had ever thought it was a good idea what I was doing. So even your parents were wrong on this one. Even, yeah, because they were just, they, I mean, no one understood what I was doing. Everyone thought I was crazy. Like, why don't you just be more like your brother? Like, you keep losing at business. Like, you're, like, you're not good at it. You keep failing. I'm like, no, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. So then I moved from Connecticut to San Diego for this Hard Rock Hotel um, lending project with a friend. And I, by the time I get to San Diego, it's not more than... You know, by the time I actually move out there, it's not more than a, like a month or so. That's when the meltdown happened. Mm. So imagine it's like you move your life across the country for a project, and then yeah. the economy implodes. You have crazy timing, my friend. Yeah, so that sucked. <laughs> then <laughs> I came back to Connecticut, had another business that was um, a really cool co concept. It's kind of a long story. But the long story on that one is I built it. It looked like it had all the seeds of success. I got on like local TV and I was in all the papers. It started to look like it was good. I ended up getting sued for trademark infringement, Ooh. which was totally um, something that I had tried to protect against. Yeah. I was actually, you know, got the legal work done, but yeah. it was erroneous legal work and all this stuff. So I found myself at 28, 50K in debt. And it was, it was one of those scenarios where, I mean, people were starting to try and convince me to just give up. Right. I mean, family, friends, and it was just like, dude, you seem like you've got some wits about it. Like, you're not an idiot. You're mm -hmm. just not good at business. You right. Know, like, you got bad get a job. Like, and now at this point, all my friends are getting married. All my friends have houses. All my friends have lives. I mean, even starting to have kids. So for me, it was just like, man, I was really starting to feel like a loser. You know, like I kept chasing it. And so, you know, it was a tough point. I was so financially stressed out that at 28 years old, I was 213 pounds. Wow. Right now I'm like one, uh, I'm a little, I'm running a little higher than normal from the honeymoon. <laughs> I'm about, Are little, you married now? Yes, I'm married, man. I did not know that. Yeah. So now I feel bad for not saying that. Yeah, thanks that. for, thanks for, you know. Yeah, did you get my wedding gift? Yeah, you get <laughs> My publicist sends <laughs> gifts sometimes on my half, my behalf, and people will be like, yeah. Oh, that was such a good gift. And I didn't I'm get like, the RSVP yeah. back for the wedding, so I was like, man, I guess he's blown oh, man. off, man. But, <laughs> um, but so I go to the doctor at 28 years old, 213 pounds, and they had me, they prescribed Lipitor. Um, Lipitor at 28? Yeah. Okay. Blood thinners, I was taking low What do you dose, think you're at now, like 170 or something? Um, Like 185. Yeah. yeah. I should be 175 yeah. or so, but... Um, and I, I used to have to take low dose aspirin just to thin my blood. I used to wear, have to wear mobile EKG to monitor oh my, my heart and everything because I was so stressed out because up to that point, I sacrificed my 20s. I was working from the moment my eyes opened until midnight. Yeah. And, but I was working incorrectly. Like it wasn't, it wasn't profit producing activities. It's like, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs can relate to this, that there's like good work in wasteful work you yeah. know it's like I was at the computer and I was doing stuff all day but I wasn't accomplishing anything you know mm -hmm. what I mean so like I felt like I was working but I really wasn't working as hard or not yeah focused. and the 67 steps one of the things I talk about is flurries of activity yeah so most people aren't end game oriented they're more excited that they're doing lots of stuff they're like I was you busy. know little tour yeah it's busy yeah. workers and it's not busy work that creates momentum wealth any of that if you get in that game of like just going, well, I have a longer checklist than you. I checked off 48 things. All the big baller guys that I know, I had this Neil guy here the other day who's, uh, you know, investment banker, raised a billion dollars. I was, I said, what's this? He's 73. What's the secret to your success? He goes, every day I wake up and I have one project that I want to be sure that I finish. One thing. So I have these other friends, mm -hmm. always your bro most broke friends, most unemployed friends. Those are the, the ones who are all frazzled. They're like, you're like, hey, can you come help me? I'm moving. They're like, oh my God, you're not gonna believe how busy I am. I'm like, dude, you're unemployed. How busy can't, you're fat too. So it's not like you're ripped in the gym running a marathon or something, but it's that mentality that makes you end up broke. Oh yeah. You know? And, and that's what I was trying to avoid the whole time. You know, I was trying to avoid being broke and being working so much. And so I was, I mean, it was clear, you know, um, in a relationship, it was like, 
work is my number one priority. So, and that's uh, above friendships, above family, above God. I mean, work was my thing and, and it wasn't happening. And then, so 28 years old, health was deterior deteriorating and it wasn't good. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, I, for the first time I started to waver in my belief of like whether or not I was capable. So yeah. like that was the, I've always been gifted with belief. Like my mom always right. was cool about You're an optimist. Yeah. Like I always figured I'd eventually make it. But and eventually optimism freaks out. Yeah. yeah. It, and I, and I, so I, I started questioning things for a little bit and then uh, my mom gave me the book, the secret. Oh, and I, she gave me the book and she just wrote in it. I believe in you. And I'm getting goosebumps like crazy thinking about it because that I, I took the book, I read it in one sitting and the book, I mean, it, it's just That's about the Rhonda Byrne. Yeah. Book, I mean, it, it's Byrne. just yeah. about how, how, what you think shows up in your life, yeah. you know? And, and that's the secret, you know, thoughts become things. And, and so in that moment I was like, you know what, if I stay positive and I get really clear on what I want that I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to manifest the business. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. So I, from that, I said, you know what, I'm going to tattoo myself yeah. with a goal, um, to sell a company in two years. And, uh, so I got a cross on my chest and the S there's a logo in the book, the secret with an S. Okay. And it's like a it seal. And so I have a cross and I, in the middle I have the S huh. and then it says believe 2012 backwards. And so now people if you like, would have put it like on your neck or your forehead, <laughs> that would have been a strong a better reminder. I know. Yeah. You should have said sell by 30. Yeah. So I did the believe 2012 and so it was backwards. So if you were to look at it, it'd be like, dude, what's the gibberish. But in the, in the mirror, it's incredible because right. you can just see it clearly. And so I figured that, um, that if I tattooed myself, like I, I'd have to do it, you know? And, uh, and so I did that. And then I also wrote a letter to myself and in the letter, I wrote it in a way as if it was the day after I turned 30. And so in the letter, <clears throat> I wrote things like, you know, I basically got myself to picture what it would look like. When I read the letter, I would get goosebumps every single time I read it because it would, you know, it would talk about the experience of how no one thought I could do it, but you know, here I sit, you know, the day after I turn 30 and I'm so proud of you, Nick. And you know, you know, mm. your purpose is to help other people find theirs. I didn't even know why I wrote that in there, but now as a coach, that's what I do for people. But so I wrote all this stuff in the letter as to what would, how I would manifest selling a company in two years. I didn't even know what it would be. I had no idea. I was down and out, but I wrote that letter and I would read it to myself every single day religiously. And as soon as I did that, it was unbelievable what happened all of a sudden it's like little things started popping up like little just things started to change um you know i ended up just changing my diet and like so all these little coincidences started coming to me like i started attracting the right things and then all of a sudden it was um a random i think it was like a saturday night and i see an email and i'm going through my email and i'm getting emails from all these different gurus and and at like one in the morning or middle of the night, I watched this video and it must have been at least an hour and it was by Evan Pagan. Oh yeah. And it was a sales letter video where he He's just- He's an internet marketing guy that te has taught a lot of people successfully how to build businesses and he's been successful, he's an interesting guy. And, and so basically what he described was, he described my challenge better than I could have described it you know, being overwhelmed, not sure where to start, wanting to build an online brand, like starting businesses and failing. So he, the whole time I'm sitting there like, dude, this guy has got my number. Like this guy, it's like he was talking to me because right. he's, he's a brilliant with copy and, yeah. and he's super smart. So then I see that and then I'm like, crap, it's five grand. I didn't have five grand. Oh, he had a program that yeah. you so yeah. yeah, it was an offer for five grand for his guru mastermind. And, um, and I had invested in some other courses and you know, commercial real estate course and crazy things. And, but at, in that moment, I, um, I talked discover into extending the line, which was the last, your last credit card. Oh, oh. Every, they mean, gave you, you had 50 grand in debt and they gave you another five. You are a good sales. 2,500. Oh, 2,500. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was, I had that. And then I had a friend go in halves on it. Okay. And, um, so I just was like, I gotta be there. So I get to this event. And at this event, the first day I meet this guy, Scott, I actually was on a video testimonial of Evan Pagan's and I wish I could, I, I think they actually have it, but I was, 
so convinced that I meet this guy, Scott, and I was like, in a video testimony, I was like, I just met a guy who will be a business partner. Mm. I know it. And, you know, I'm at this event. I'm so broke. It was in L.A. I lived in Connecticut. I had to, to go there with protein mix in a sandwich bag. So people would do lunch. And imagine, if everyone's there that paid five grand, everyone there is, you know, either has some money or yeah. they're smart or right. they're entrepreneurs. or You know, they're, it's a good room, you know. And they're like, all right, you know, every time go do lunch or go do dinner. And I'd be like, you know, I've got a really important call to make. Give me a couple minutes. Go to the room. Take, you know, the little hotel cups? Yeah. One of those little guys without a hotel sink water, protein, spoon. That's all you could afford. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I didn't even have a blender ball. Yeah. You know? Like, like <laughs> you when I think about that, <laughs> yeah, my, dude, my life would have been so much better. Than, <laughs> like, I remember, like, gagging and choking and, like, <laughs> and, like protein dust coming protein out. Protein powder. <laughs> it was you like, were dusty. <laughs> like, burp, and it was like, this it was dude's disgusting. dusty. I so like that. And was, by the way, little side note here, not to take away, but you guys like the shirt. <laughs> it's Knowledge. good. It's good. The book in there. A little book instead of a W. For um, those of you not good at reading. That's good. That's like that. It's good branding right there. No, I just power. messed up my microphone. All right. Back to the so, dust. So, you know, after the dustiness of the protein and stuff, and then, um, you know, I just, I met smart people there. Evan Pagan said something that changed me forever, and he was just like, because I was all over the place. I was overwhelmed. You know, if you're an entrepreneur or want to be an entrepreneur, it's like maybe you can relate to having a lot of opportunities and, or not even opportunities, but just being overwhelmed with choices yeah. and not knowing what to zero in on. So he's like, you just have to pick something. So I figured I had been burned by timing with that company Excel, with real estate, with all these other endeavors. And then I saw what was going on with Facebook and I said, you know what? I'm going to be the next Facebook marketing expert. Okay. And so at this time, you know, it's at this point, it's 2010. So it's only about, you know, five years and change ago. And, uh, but Facebook was blowing up. No businesses had any clue how to use it. There was a woman, Mari Smith, or it still is. She's like the boss of Facebook, you know, and, and I looked at what she was doing and I was like, there's room for two, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I come back home and I'm like, I'm going to be a Facebook marketing expert. And can you imagine what people said? Right. They thought this was your next. It was like, like oh I've no, never, here's Nick again. I've never heard so many belly laughs. Like, you know, yeah. like, like people crying, laughing because I didn't, I wasn't even on Facebook. Like my, t I technically had an account, but I didn't start posting till 2010. Uh. So I knew nothing about it. And again, it was one of these things where, you know, I got laughed at for it. And I was like, you know what? I will prove you all wrong. Like I'm yeah. reverse polarity. Meaning when someone says you can't do it, like yeah. that whole watch thing, yeah. I was like, I'm going to do it. So I came back and it was that same belief. I kept reading the letter and first 30 days I went out and I just pounded the pavement. I got clients like that. I made my first five grand in 30 days and I went huh. to networking meetings and I realized that. And by the way, we're going to, for those of you watching this and listening uh, to this free talk, uh, I'm also going to bring Nick here into the accelerator in a second. We're going to record. So stuff on the uh, entrepreneur, specifically on financial stuff. I try to keep these around 20, 30 minutes. So for those of you in the accelerator, make sure you go to my website and log into your private login. For those of you not in the accelerator, get into it. Get there's, stuff, in there. there's stuff in there uh, for cheaper than the price of going to one quarter of community college. I've got more stuff from self-made entrepreneurs, whether they be billionaires or just making half a million bucks, which is a lot of money. So yeah, make sure you stay tuned because we're gonna go kind of step by step. I'll put a link somewhere around here, but uh, but yeah, before we do, before we go into that, so you build this. What was kind of the the final where you know you made it? The, what what did you get revenue up to? So so the I made it. So what was crazy was like starting locally, and it was the biggest shift from being busy to focusing on profit producing activities. And once I got that, it was like, oh, okay, all I need to do is have more conversations. And right. I realized like for every 10 people I talk to, I'm getting two clients. And so I went So from, you knew your ratios. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and, and so, and I knew no one knew anything about Facebook marketing. And, and people always say, well, how can you just be an expert if you don't have a lot of experience? And someone gave me the best advice and they were just like, if you know more than whoever you're talking to, then you are an expert. Right. So, and that's, and that got me over the fear. So I just kept going. I went from local to then thinking, well, I can't scale this. It's way too much work, you know? So 
I wanted to work with um, celebrities, I wanted to work with authors, um, gurus, if you will. So what I did was I started running ads and I just targeted chief marketing officers on Facebook. Oh, okay. And Smart. that's the brilliance of Facebook is you can literally market to whoever you want. If you want to market to people that make over a hundred grand a year, awesome. Just yeah. zero that in on Facebook. So I targeted chief marketing officers. I created an incredible funnel that had, was all value. I wasn't selling anything. And I went from using these really stupid tactics that other people were teaching, like put a blonde woman with an iPad and do a contest. And I got awful click-through rates because I would have a woman with an iPad with my Nick Unsworth right. Facebook page. They're like, this is it, Nick. Versus, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Nick grew a beard. <laughs> so, then I, so then I just realized that, you know what? It's about personal interactions and about the click-through rate. It's about, it, just like what you said on our show is that you said it's about the relevance. It's about the virality. Yes. So I just switched that tune and I started being me and it was like, I'll never forget when I had a question that was, "What do you think of my new? Fa uh, what do you think of my new fan page?" Question mark. And people interacted and commented, mm, and at that yeah. time, it blew up the click through open rate. Open-ended questions. Oh, I was are getting opt-ins for five cents. And, yeah. And so what happened was, I'm started to grow my email list, grow influence, grow the brand for that little niche. And I'll never forget, I lived in a dumpy multifamily. I mean, yellow countertops, no garbage disposal, no dishwasher. You know grimy part of town, um, not the ghetto, but it's not that bad, but Connecticut. Oh, Connecticut. Because okay. I moved back to Connecticut yeah. after the crash. So, and I get this call from this guy, Quincy, and he's like, hey, we've got this um, you know, big technology conference. Um, well, let me back up when he first called. He's like, I'd like to speak to Nick, to Nick Unsworth. And I'm like, yeah, this is Nick. And he's like, oh. Thought it'd be a secretary first. That's yeah. exactly what he said. <laughs> and I you said, should have answered with a high voice first. Like, Hello. <laughs> and then switch. Oh, okay, let me transfer you. Yeah, and I was like, well, you know, we believe that, you know, long lunches here at New Media 2.0. And so, <laughs> it, but what's so cool about that is it was the perception from yeah. running ads. So just by having an By ad, branding yourself yeah, in a certain way. Exactly. And we're going to talk about that in Accelerator. How to do yeah. Facebook ads. So there's so much that it's you. It's key. Yeah. And so that and little branding, tricks like that, I like that question. Like that, How do you like my new fan page? That's a good one. Yeah, and it, and it just switched from being a company to being friendly in yeah. a person and and then adding value. And so, um, you know, we're on the phone and then he's like, we got this big technology conference in Honolulu and we're looking for a keynote speaker. I'm oh. not sure we can afford you. But and you're like, you definitely can't. <laughs> but for you, my friend, if that's the line. Me, for you, my you friend. Bring, if you give me cheese, you some cheese, can you give me a dishwasher? Because I don't have one right now. That's what you should have said. That would establish authority. Oh, man. I'll never forget and taking cereal and like, I can't put it in the drain. Like, I put it in the toilet. Have oh, you ever had man. to do that? No. Oh. Uh, I did but, live with no electricity in an outhouse, but then you can just dump it in the outhouse. <laughs> there you go. How about that? But um, so it was, it was, you know, so I ended up saying yes to the keynote. He says, send me your, your media kit. I'm like, yeah, you got it. And yeah, you're like, let me make a media Googling, kit. Googling, what's a media kit? <laughs> That's um, a cool, you know, Bill Gates had this when he would get on the phone, he sounded like a teenager because he was 15 or whatever. <laughs> so he'd, had, he'd be like, oh yes, uh, I would like to. <laughs> like Barry you. White? Yeah, <laughs> Barry White. Hello? You need those voice synthesizers. I need, yeah. So so that right there, it it got me from local to like online, and then I reached back to people I met at Evan's event. I started doing ads for Evan Pagan, Frank Kern. And oh wow. So long story short is one of the guys, that guy, Scott, who I met at that event was my first five-figure contract, my first six-figure contract, and he started taking up so much of my time that I said, listen, I, I've got to scale this back. I can't have right. more than half my book of business coming right, from, from, from you time. guys. And then they said, well, what the heck, why don't we buy your business? And all of a sudden it was like, <laughs> like, yeah. our, like, like, wow, like it all came together. So that dude ended up buying New Media 2.0 and it happened, of course, exactly in 2012, closed before the end of 2012 when I turned 30. So it's oh, just crazy. So the letter, the, letter, the tattoo. Man. Oh yeah, I can be proud of that tattoo. You're proud. You could tell when you're 75 and your grandkids are like, what grandkids. is that, Grandpa? And you're like, <laughs> back when I was 30. The I S saw. is going to be all dragged down. <laughs> 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 That's what it's gonna say. Let me get an S. It's gonna be a shh sound. <laughs> they're gonna be like, were you one of them people that thought the world was end ending, Grandpa? Yeah, I think no, 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 no. Two thousand millennium. <laughs> All right. So now we're gonna take this private into the accelerator. Uh, 
an amazing story. Like I tell people, there's stories like this happening all around the world in all countries, all types of people. And at the end of the day, I like what you said. You know, the secret is one of those controversial things. There's a part of me that likes it, part of me it doesn't. You have to think about stuff before you do it. And so some people think the secret is a magic formula where you just sit in a chair and you you, you hum. try to, yeah, you hum, hum. And, and you write yourself a check for a million bucks. But it's the KSE formula that, I, that I've developed, you know, knowledge. Yeah. You see him going to conferences, buying packages, getting, uh, you know, coached, and all these different things lead up then to the S. And the S is the part of the strategy is first you have to think. So that's where the secret comes in. It's like, okay, now I think what is my outcome? You're like an army general. My goal, I'm 28. By 30, I'm going to hit this goal. That's like an army general does the same thing. They go, okay, we're going to deploy the forces here. And at 0600 hours, they're going to be here. And that's just a simple, practical way, way of thinking about the secret. And a lot of people don't have that strategy session. So they'll, they'll just sw switch right to the activity of doing stuff. And that's why, you know, at a restaurant, next restaurant you go to, the hardest working person is busboy or people in the back in the kitchen. Uh, but the highest paid person is the person who's probably either in an office or at home who owns the restaurant. And uh, there's nothing wrong with being a busboy or a waiter or waitress, but you want to evolve your life step by step like yeah. you did. Next thing you know, you're 50 grand in debt and you got a half a million bucks <coughs> wired into the bank account. Feels good. And you're getting paid to eat cheese. Getting paid to eat cheese. <laughs> cool. So, Nick, we're going to go into the private accelerator. If you're not in there, click the link. I'll explain what you get on my website. What's the best way to follow you? Because you got yeah. lots of cool stuff going. Yeah, so I would say um, the best way I could give uh, would be Life on Fire TV. So on YouTube also, just lifeonfire.com. Life, like L-I-F-E Life. on fire. Lifeonfire.com. We have all kinds of just awesome content to help you basically set your business and life on fire. Sweet. Thanks for being yeah, on. Man. Thanks for having me, dude. See you guys in the accelerator. Get Click up the in link. There.